Uh, it's really great to be here, to share our experiences, and um, to hear and share with others who are facing very similar challenges, I think, to, to what we are. Um, <coughs> the way you pronounce the company is Pushli Sani. Uh, it means to develop. It's really an instruction to people to develop. Okay. Uh, the rights of the poor who live on and make use of communal land across the globe are, are increasingly insecure and under threat. Their vulnerability is heightened when, firstly, land governance and administration systems are weak, when land is managed by external officials, and <clears throat> when there is inadequate recordal of rights. Insecure land rights opens the door for elite capture and makes right holder, rights holders reluctant to invest their labor and money into that land. Land activists across the world are, are in search of remedies to reverse this toxic trend. And we argue that partial immunity <coughs> lies in the development and legal recognition of local land governance and recordal systems which enhance local control and which are backed by legal reforms that provide legally um, secure rights. Sorry, I'm just getting used to this thing. There you go. We're busy doing this <coughs> in Ebenezer, with the Ebenezer community on the west coast of, of South Africa. And I want to talk about this experience um, with the Ebenezer community, who've been living on this land for many centuries. But before I talk about Ebenezer specifically, I want to contextualize um, this process in three ways. Firstly, by looking um, at the broad history of dispossession in South Africa. Secondly, by looking at the land reform program in South Africa. And thirdly, by looking a bit at the history of, of Ebenezer itself. The San and Khoi um, people are considered to be the indigenous people of South Africa. And when the Europeans first set up a naval supply station in, in Cape Town, in 1652, the San and Khoi were living across various parts of South Africa. Colonial expansion and the development of agriculture in, in the Cape relied on slave labor. And the Khoi San fought many wars of resistance, but were either turned into slaves or vagrants on their own land. And until 1934, 1834, beg your pardon, most farm labor was based either on slavery or on uh, restrictions, uh, vagrancies with restrictions contained in the various Khoi um, codes and vagran vagrancy ordinances. Many of the Khoi Sands settled on mission stations <coughs> uh, which got, be became established across, across South Africa. And they did this to resist the oppressive laws and to retain at least some access to land. Wars of conquest um, <coughs> waged in the 19th century meant that by 1900, um, most of South Africa <coughs> was under colonial control. The process of creating black homelands and colored or mixed race reserves was the cornerstone of apartheid. And it meant that when <coughs> by, 19, uh, by 1994, just 13% of South Africa was in the hands of black people. And um, the remaining 87% was either <coughs> owned by white owned companies individuals, and the state. Let's talk to, turn to land reform in South Africa. With the end of formal apartheid in 1994, we introduced um, a, a land reform program which was based on the property clause in the Constitution. And it has three um, legs um, of the land reform, <coughs> of land reform. Firstly, restitution. That is where individuals or groups or communities that were dispossessed of, of land under the previous governments could claim <coughs> restitution of that land, either restoration of the land, alternative land, or cash compensation. The second component of land reform is around redistribution. Those people that had never had any access to land can apply and get access to land for a variety of needs. And the third, the third is tenure reform, where those that are living on land currently, <coughs> but with very insecure rights, are able to then access support to, to strengthen those rights, the tenure reform. There has, however, been significant failure of land reform 
um, since 1994. Over 8 million hectares have been transferred, and at least 50% of that land is either un- or underutilized. Importantly, the majority of this land is held by communal, uh, co communal entities, land, land property entities, either trusts or communal property associations. The Department of, of Rural Development and Land Reform that is responsible for these CPAs <coughs> uh, reported in, in 2016 that only 208 of 1,490 of these uh, entities were compliant with the law. The rest were not. This failure of land reform is extremely complex and involves many factors, but we argue that the lack of governance and administration of land rights is one of the most important factors in this regard. <coughs> Let's turn to Ebenezer's history. The Ebenezer community descended primarily from the Khoi people, the indigenous people of South Africa, and when the whites arrived in that area in the early 1800s, they found the community there. The state allocated some crown land <coughs> to the mission church and to the community under the management of the church. And so it, at that time, that the, the first time the Ebenezer community got access and rights, formal rights to land was in 1837. But that land access was under the management of the church, the Rhenish um, mission church at that point. In 1909, a law was passed which transferred the land allocated to many mission stations back under the control of the, church, uh, of the state. The policy priority, this is early 1900, uh, sort of 1900 to 1930, the policy priority for government was um, creating opportunities for, for poor whites, many of whom were dispossessed of land in the wars between the British and the Boers um, in the late, right at the end of the 19th century. For Ebenezer, this focus had devastating consequences for the community. The state decided to build a dam and a canal system to provide an affirmative action land reform program for, what, for poor whites. <coughs> and this targeted the, the Ebenezer community, which was located at the end of the canal system. So the state passed a law which dispossessed the community of the most productive part of their land and removed them to alternative land, but inferior land over the hill. Um, adding a number of other portions of land in the process. On this reallocated re land, 153 families were allocated a plot, <coughs> a house plot, an arable plot with water, and communal grazing land. And that number of, of land rights holders re remains today. So there are still 153 plot holders with 1.6 hectares of land and eight grazing camps, which... Um, uh, are subdivided into subcamps for, for um, rotational grazing purposes. The community in the meantime has grown to 2,500 people. This land continues to be owned at the moment by the national state <coughs> and the land rights have been managed with various degrees of success by the municipality. When we began our work at Ebenezer in 2013, we found the following. There was no management of land rights by the municipality. 65 of the, the 153 plot uh, rights holders um, had not been formally allocated after the death of the former um, uh, rights holders. And disputes were aplenty amongst the, the, the rights holders and within the community generally. On the grazing uh, areas, communal grazing areas, 97 individuals without formal rights were on that land um, farming with, with um, sheep and cattle. And there was significant um, elite capture by some people who were able to keep others out of the areas that they were allocated. So for Ebenezer, the, <coughs> there are two land reform processes. One is restitution for, for the land that they were dispossessed of. The second is tenure reform. Uh, strengthening the rights on the land that they're on. I'm only going to deal with the uh, tenure reform processes given the focus of today's um, discussion. The, the applicable legislation there is the Transformation of Certain Rural Areas Act. And that really is focused on all these mixed race or colored reserves of which there are 23 in South Africa. 
And it requires the community to, to decide who will be the future owner of that land and management of that land. They can decide to cut it up and divide it amongst them. They can decide to hand it over to the municipality for the municipality to manage it on their behalf. Or they can decide to hold it as a community establishing a communal property entity, which is what Ebenezer decided to do. They established what's called an, a communal property association. So there are, are two uh, focuses of our interventions. One is on the ground, um, developing local tenure arrangements at Ebenezer. The second focus is at a national level, um, a broader policy um, intervention to develop a national recordal system which recognizes communal land rights within a land rights continuum. So there were three processes that we then undertook at Ebenezer. The first was to manage a land rights inquiry process to clarify who has ra what rights to the different portions of land. The second was to facilitate a de the design, a participatory design of a new tenure of new tenure arrangements at Ebenezer, um, which would be under community control. And the third was to design an appropriate local land rights recordal system. Um, as on, on the land. The land rights inquiry um, <coughs> uh, involved five processes. The first was the enumeration of rights holders. Who says that they have a right to a land? Um, the second was adjudication. And with adjudication, it was very important for us to understand the, the difference and the relationship between customary understanding of land rights and and the formal le legislated um, manner in which land rights were obtained and, and transferred. We looked at certification in, in adjudicating. Does it, did the person have a certificate? Who is actually using the land now? So who has the de facto rights to the land on the ground? And then we looked at, was this person who said that they had a right um, eligible to be a member of the CPA, the Communal Property Association, according to the membership criteria. The third component in our land rights inquiry was around mediation and arbitration. There were a number of conflicts and, and, and disputes around the allocations or, uh, that were made. The fourth was to then take that to the municipality, who is the formal administrator of the land, to get that confirmed and passed in a municipal council resolution. Once that had happened, then to, we facilitated on the ground um, uh, <coughs> agreements around boundaries. So we got neighbors to come together at the boundaries and say, is this the agreed place? Yes, and we took the coordinates um, and then got them to sign an agreement that that was where it was. The second component <coughs> um, was developing what we call the land use management system, essentially the tenure arrangements for the future. What we did there was, was um, <coughs> firstly, we researched and provided technical detail about each of the different land parcels uh, on the land. We then conducted a community process which involved um, people dividing up into to focus groups. Those focus groups then visited the different portions of land came back and developed proposals around what kind of land rights, what kind of management systems, what are the responsibilities for, of each individual and so forth. Um, and then presented that to the, to the plenary which was then critiqued. We as Pushlisani then wrote that up into proposals which are in the process of going through the community for final acceptance. This participatory process that we ran was extremely successful. For the first time community felt that they were involved in determining their future of how the land should be, um, uh, what rights should be there, how it should be managed and so forth. And for <coughs> the municipality and the Department of Agriculture, it was the first time that they'd been involved in a process and they were also very excited about it. Some of the key issues that um, emerged out of this process were the following. Firstly, how do we cl clarify individual rights on community land, communal land? And it was agreed in the absence of, of other forms of uh, formal rights, it was agreed to provide members with a with title, but with restrictions in that title deed 
that, that if they wanted to sell or uh, transfer that land, it had to go to a member of the communal property association. The second was how to clarify, uh, <coughs> given the nature of that grazing rights, that, that it was um, communal grazing, how to clarify that right? What kind of right should it be? Eventually, a fully tradable communal grazing right was agreed to. And then finally, it was around management. How should this ma land be managed, given its community land? So in that process, the CPA appoints a, a manager, but there is an association of users that um, works with the manager. With regard to the recordal system, there is, no cur there is currently no system of recording communal rights in a local and national register in South Africa. So for Ebenezer, we're drawing on the thinking and development of such systems internationally. And we've decided to go with the social tenure domain model, <coughs> which has been designed and developed by the Global Land Tool Network connected to the UN, to UN Habitat. This approach seeks to, to clarify the nature of the rights that a person or group has to a specific spatial um, unit, a land, piece of land, uh, uh, water body, or natural resource. The design of this at Ebenezer has been quite challenging. Uh, but we're making progress, working very closely with uh, GLTN. The objective is that this recordal and management system of rights will be locally controlled by the CPA so that there's community control. This requires a recordal system which is cheap, which is locally operated and easy to, easy to update, but which is linked into the national system to allow oversight and further formalization if required. Our work at Ebenezer is linked to our national policy interventions to find remedies against elite capture. South African property law does not easily accommodate communal land rights, and the absence of, some, of such a law is one of the reasons that the rights of people in such circumstances are, is, are so vulnerable. Pushisane is um, playing a leading role in a broader intervention to reform um, property law in South Africa, and the aim of, would be to provide for local management and register of rights, which, but which cascades up through the municipality into the National Deed, Deeds Office. The intervention is located <coughs> within a national titling debate where um, individual title is, is considered the apex of property rights. Oh, that's it. So the jury is still out about how successful this intervention will be. But it's critical in South Africa where over 30 million people live in contexts where their rights fall outside of the formal property um, system. So our aim has been to avoid capture of land by elites in communities and to achieve the land, land tenure security objective which is espoused in our constitution. And the key lessons that we've drawn from this experience are, firstly, within, with uh, land rights inquiries, we must really spend time to understand the nature of the rights in custom, in law, and on the ground. Secondly, the process to clarify and formalize the land rights and tenure arrangements must be participatory in design, involving as many of the community members as possible to ensure and enable sufficient consensus. These processes must be practical, affordable, and supported by adequate technical information so that people can make proper decisions. The recordal systems must be sufficiently flexible to capture and certify the range of rights making up the continuum in each con context. Fourthly, the land rights management and recordal systems must be supported by the local state in order to enable local level landholding entities to implement the agreed tenure system and to contain the power of local elites to appropriate um, resources beneficial to the poor. Finally, the record systems must link into national formal record of systems, otherwise the nature of these local rights will be undermined and rele relegated to secondary status, second class status. So these have been our experiences at Ebenezer. <coughs> I'm really you know, putting it out there, we're in the process of, of establishing these. The days are still early, and, uh, but really looking forward to sharing and hearing some more on the, the, pro the processes involved in other areas. Thank you.